to bite into an onion. Today's scripture comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, which arguably has had the most influence on biblical theology and the growth of the church than any other book in the New Testament. And like all of Paul's letters, Romans was intended to be read to the church to which it was addressed. Um, But unlike all of his other letters, except for Colossians, it was written to a congregation that Paul didn't know personally. He hadn't spent any time with them. However, he did send them one of the deepest theological writings we have in our Bible. And one of the things I, I really appreciate about this letter is that it deals with both doctrine and ethics. Now, this letter can be roughly divided into two sections, with uh, the first 11 chapters dealing with, with theology and doctrine, and the rest of the letter dealing with more practical matters of the faith. So just keep that in mind as we look at one particular part of this letter. So let's listen now to a few verses from chapter 12. I'm going to read verses 1 and 2 out of chapter 12. And this is what Paul writes. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Would you pray with me? God, I pray that you will speak through us. You will speak through everything that's said today. And now that you will speak through my words, so that each of us will hear what you want us to hear today. Help us to listen and to respond in faithful ways. And we pray that we would be transformed so that our lives would be holy and acceptable to you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now there's a mantra, I think, fitting for the new year that goes like this. It's easier to live your way into a new way of thinking than to think your way into a new way of living. Those words are on the screen. Would you say that with me? Let's read this together. It is easier to live your way into a new way of thinking than to think your way into a new way of living. Now, these words, I think, are relevant to us as we consider Paul's instruction to the church in Rome where he says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Paul was guiding the church to see that the Christian faith is ultimately something we do. Now, it is more than thought. It's it's more than doctrines and teaching. It's a way of life because Christians are called to live the gospel. Now, as I mentioned a few moments ago, the the book is really divided into two sections. In the first 11 chapters of Romans, Paul lays out a theological foundation for the Christian life. And then in the rest of Romans, Paul describes some of the ways that we're to live this out in our daily lives. The first two verses of chapter 12 really serve as a transition between these two sections. And it gets us thinking about the attitudes and actions that should be part of a Christian's life. Now, there is a lot of important information in this letter to the Romans. Paul helps us think deeply about faith in Jesus Christ. But this information isn't meant to be put in the backs of our minds and stored away for the future. That's not what Paul intended. Instead, he wants us He wants the church to live what he teaches. He wants the church to live by the teachings and the example of Jesus. And to do this requires commitment and lots and lots of practice. Now, I think this is an important word for us to hear because we often think that the faith is about having the right answers. But faith involves more than knowledge. Faith is about lifestyle. 
It's just as much about doing as it is believing. And so what I really want to emphasize today is the value and the importance of practicing the Christian faith. The more we practice gospel living, the better we are at living the way that Christ invites us to live. And practice certainly is a critical part of us achieving success. One person who comes to mind as a great example of success for me is Michael Jordan. Now, Michael Jordan, in my opinion, is the greatest basketball player of all time. Now, he's known for his accomplishments. He's won six NBA championships, two slam dunk titles, five MVP awards, and one NCAA championships, among other awards. Now, people also remember him for some of his fantastic dunks, like the time when he lifted off from the foul line, gliding towards the rim for a one-handed slam. And that dunk ultimately became the iconic dunk that morphed into the Jordan brand logo. We also remember Jordan for hitting game-winning shots. And my favorite as a Carolina guy is the 1982 NCAA championship. My second favorite is the 1998 NBA Finals against the Utah Jazz. He hit some fantastic shots over his career, and that made it so much fun to watch him play. People talk about Jordan as the most talented and greatest basketball player of all time, but he'll tell you that talent isn't enough. You have to practice. And then you've got to practice some more and more and more. Jordan had an incredible work ethic. And he developed an intense workout routine that helped him build up his his skills and his strength as well as conquer his weaknesses. He wanted to succeed and he put in the time to make that possible. His high school coach even said that he could never get Jordan out of the gym. He was always working on his game. And throughout his career, he was known as the first guy in the gym and the last one out. Practice is a critical skill that's needed in so many areas of life, including with discipleship. Now, Jesus calls us to be his disciples in the world, and there are a lot of things that he asks us to do. Some of it even sounds counterintuitive. Now think back to the instructions that Jesus gave to his followers. He said things like, the first must be last, and the last will be first. To be rich, you have to become poor. Forgive your enemies. Welcome those people who look strange to you, and and be a servant. Now on one level, these teachings just don't make much sense to us, and they certainly don't feel like the way to happiness and success. But on another level, we see from the witness of faithful disciples who've gone before us that following these instructions is the key to renewal. Doing these things helps us discover a new and fresh way of of life. And so we practice the faith. And we practice the faith by doing the things that Jesus asked us to do. I think at first, doing these things and living like a Christian can feel unnatural. It can feel difficult, even burdensome. But the more we do it, the more right it feels until one day we find ourselves living the gospel without even thinking about what we're doing. In theological terms, this is called sanctification. Now, sanctification is a a long process of transformation. It takes a long time, in part, because we like sinning. We're good at it. Now, even after we invite Christ into our lives, we stumble, we falter. But little by little, as we practice the Christian faith, transformation happens. The forgiven person becomes a forgiving person. The healed person becomes a healing person. The loved person becomes a loving person. These results 
are not due to our own efforts, but to the work of God in our lives. God's grace grows in us as we practice the faith. And it shapes us into more Christ-like people. As we pray, as we study the Scriptures, as we worship together, as we give ourselves to service projects and other important works, we are being transformed into people whose lives look more and more like Jesus. There's a football team that has a sign over its practice field that says, you play like you practice. Now, how true those words are. You know, an athletic team practices and practices until the moves to win become second nature to them. That's what Michael Jordan did so well. He practiced and practiced and practiced. And we Christians need to live with that same kind of discipline. Our scripture text urges us to present ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. Paul is calling for us to give ourselves completely to God. This is a total commitment. It's a commitment of everything we have. We're not offering some part of ourselves to God, but all of it, including our thoughts, our actions, our desires, our whole personhood. Living with this kind of commitment takes real sacrifice. You know, Jesus told his disciples that there's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. That's real commitment. And that's a literal example of a living sacrifice. Now, someone has pointed out that the problem with a living sacrifice is that it keeps slithering off the altar table. I think we all know how true that is. We have all been guilty of missing the mark when it comes to living a faithful life as a disciple of Jesus. We all know what it's like to say that we're committed to the love of Jesus, but then to have it quickly nullified by a moment of anger. We all know what it's, how difficult it is to, to love our enemies and to welcome strangers. We know that there's a gap between what we say we believe and what we do. And in this regard, I think we've done our fair share of slithering off the altar table. Now, it's not easy living, being a living sacrifice that is holy and acceptable to God. And we do know this is true because we've had our slip-ups. We've missed the mark. We miss out on what God has called us to be and do. But thank goodness God is patient with us. And God keeps offering grace and forgiveness. God keeps encouraging us to live as Jesus' disciples in this world. So let's be patient with ourselves. Let's extend grace to ourselves because, truthfully, we can be our harshest critic. So keep practicing the faith. Keep doing all the things that Jesus instructs us to do. And as we practice, we'll find ourselves becoming different people. We keep practicing so that one day the world will look at us and see Jesus. Do you remember learning to drive a car? Well, some of us learn to drive on vehicles with a manual transmission. And learning to drive a stick shift requires all sorts of actions that have to be done in a certain sequence. Now, you have to push in the clutch, move the shift lever to the proper place, press the accelerator, and then slowly let up on the gas, or let up on the clutch. And then if you're able to get the car moving forward without stalling, you have to repeat it all when you move into second gear, and then third gear, and so forth. Now, if you're like me, learning to drive a stick shift was very frustrating. I didn't learn how to do this until my junior year in college. 
my buddy Jonathan Beavers felt sorry for me that I didn't know how to drive a stick shift. And so one Saturday morning, and it was a winter Saturday of 1995, he took me out in his Ram pickup truck and had me drive around Chapel Hill. And I have to say it was a, a baptism by fire. I had no idea what I was doing. And if you happen to be in Chapel Hill in January of 1995 and were driving around, my apologies. I kept starting and stalling. Uh, The truck would lurch forward and then the engine would stall. It was a sad sight. But I kept practicing. I kept practicing until I could actually synchronize the movement of my hands and feet and keep the truck moving around town. Now, I'll admit there are a lot of people who can drive a manual transmission much better than me. But I'm grateful that I learned how to do it. And I realized that the more you practice, the more it becomes second nature. The Christian faith is like this. The Christian faith and the journey that we have with Christ begins when we make a commitment to follow Jesus. And we live out that commitment by following the teachings of Jesus and learning from the church what's expected of us as his disciples. At first, the Christian life can seem awfully complicated. It may feel like there's some things that are just too hard to do. We may wonder how on earth we're going to love our enemies or give away our money to people we don't know. We may wonder how we will forgive that person who hurt us deeply. We may wonder how we can live without worrying. These are all very hard things to do. But we try to do them anyway. We practice and practice and practice. We keep showing up. And eventually, we'll find ourselves doing these things as if they are second nature. That's what discipleship's all about. This is what it means to present ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. So faith goes beyond what we think and believe. It is a lifestyle, and it requires practice. And it's certainly easier to live your way into a new way of thinking than to think your way into a new way of living. So in this new year, let's be renewed by a fresh determination to live the faith until the way of Jesus becomes so ingrained in us that the world will look at us and say, there goes a Christian. There goes someone who really follows Jesus.